So welcome to everyone. My name is Rebecca Kral, and I am the Area Focus Manager for Peace Building and Conflict Prevention. I've been with Rotary for a long time <laughs> and working with um, our peace building activities for over a decade. So a number of years with the Rotary Peace Centers, working with our Peace Fellows, and then since, since 2015 with the Area of Focus. And I am joined today by my two wonderful co-presenters. So with me, I have Summer Lewis, who is a Peace Fellow and also the coordinator for our strategic partnership with the Institute for Economics and Peace. Um, I know that they're also doing some different presentations today on their research, the Global Peace Index, the Positive Peace Framework, which is actually something that Summer and I work on on a day-to-day -day basis. So you'll see us referencing that a little bit during this presentation. And I'm also joined by Simona Pinton, who was also a Peace Fellow, I think from the original Peace Fellow class. So that's ex incredibly exciting. She's a lawyer and a senior research fellow and a lecturer in international law. She is also part of the um, Peace Building and Conflict Prevention Cadre of Technical Advisors. So Simone is going to talk to us a little bit about the Positive Peace Framework and how we apply that not only to our peace building projects, but also for all of the work that we're doing within Rotary. So just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, since I have my screen on, I can't quite see the total number of people here, but what we'd like to do during the presentation is if you have a burning question, we'd like you to actually put that into the chat box. We're also joined by Kathy Doherty, who is a local, local Chicagoan. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. And she's going to be helping Peace Fellow from Chula. She's going to be helping us monitor the conversation today. So if you have burning questions um, when, when we're speaking, just please put that in the chat. Um, Kathy, do you want them to do directly to you? Is that the best? Hope you're muted. Yeah, if people just want to post them in the chat box, then, okay. because sometimes they might direct them to, to one of, of you or all of you. So I'll just be recording those and then coming back on when it's time for question and answers. Awesome. Okay, so just put it into everyone. That's fine. So all of your questions. And then again, if we have a, a conducive group to some more open discussion, we're going to do that towards the end. Okay, so let's get started. What are we going to cover today? So I'm going to give an overview of the area of focus. It's not going to be enough time. I'll just preface that by saying, you know, that we could talk about any of these things for hours on end, but we're going to give an overview of what the area of focus is, look at gl global grant eligibility and the parameters. So in my mind, it's what is a global grant and what's really not and what's better done at, at a club or a district level. We're going to talk about the importance of community assessment in peace building, conflict sensitivity, do no harm. Then I'm going to hand it over to Summer, who's going to talk a little bit more about that and the importance of working with community partners. Then Simona is going to talk about positive peace, this idea of systems thinking, especially when we're doing peace building projects, and then applying that positive peace framework to all the work that we're doing. Now, if you're interested in doing a nuts and bolts hands-on global grant workshop. I know that um, our friend Rotarian Shab is going to be having a workshop just after this that walks you through, this is a global grant application, this is step one, this is step two, this is step three. So this is kind of your conceptual introduction and then that's gonna be your nuts and bolts hands-on, um, you know, creating a global grant. So, after this session, we will be providing some additional resources that um, aren't really conducive in this format. So we will have those available to you. All right, so without further ado, we will get started. So my first comment, <laughs> whenever I start talking about these things, especially recently, is just this concept is that there are many, many ways to build peace. Rotary has been in the business of peace for over 100 years working with the United Nations, with our ambassadorial scholars, with our group study exchange where that existed, through our international programs. So we have been doing peace for a really, really, really long time. But in 2014, we formalized our place within the peace building world through the formation of our area of focus. So that shifted our focus from a more general idea of peace building, which we still engage in, to more concrete steps of how do we actually build peace and what does that look like, both in training and education, 
but also within the community. And that is actually something new for the organization and something that we are collectively still trying to identify and understand um, where we best fit. I always say that Rotarians are strongest because of their convening power and their connections. So how can we find that place where we are able to bring people together from different cultures, areas, regions of our, of our communities, and find ways to create better dialogue and better processes. So when we talk a little bit about global grants and what is eligible in global grants, I want you to think about the more general, which is our history, all the different ways that we create bridges and connections, but then also this very narrow path, somewhat narrow path, it still you know, has options, but a more narrow path in which we fund through global grants. So I'm gonna just, these are probably like the, the least exciting slides, but I do think that it's an important overview. So where are we to date since the inception of the area of focus that um, really started in 2014? So these statistics run actually through the end of this rotary year. So we, we have not included um, all of the grants that we've approved in this rotary year. So basically in, um, as of last year, we had over $20 million invested and almost 500, 500 uh, global grants. So if I were to run the numbers, which will happen probably in the next couple of weeks, I would say we're well over 500 and maybe even approaching $27 million in, in funding. And remember, this is just within global grants. So this does not include the Rotary Peace Centers. It does not include all of the projects that happen at the club, club and district level. Now this I think is, a, is an important slide as well because it shows us the passion and the interest for scholarships. Just like we have the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program, we've had a history of ambassadorial scholarships. So the majority of our investments right now are in that scholarship space. You'll see our other areas of investment are capacity building, youth programming, school-based programming. But as you can see, these numbers are small compared to what we're investing in our scholars. So today we're gonna to focus a little bit more on what it looks like to build peace at the local level because we have a lot of room for growth in that area. And where are we investing? So you'll see that Europe and the Americas have the highest numbers here. That primarily pertains to scholarships because they have um, the most number of higher, in the, um, higher education where people are studying. However, we have seen with community-based programs a significant investment in, um, in both Latin America and North America. So those numbers are growing. Most of the other regions pertain directly to non-scholarship activities. So that's vocational training teams and that is um, humanitarian activities. So what are we talking about when we talk about projects in global grants within peace building and conflict prevention? Because as I opened up with the first slide, it can be a little bit confusing, right? Because we say peace building and that can mean many, many, many different things. But we do have this more narrow path when it comes to global grants and what we actually fund within that area. So this is a general statement from the policy statement, which is one of the documents I'll share with you. But Rotary primarily invests through our global grant activities, the training, education, and practices related to peace building and conflict prevention. And these are initiatives that help create and transform conflict at the local level. And I wanted to take a quick pause here because I don't know if some of you have noticed this, but our area of focus used to be um, peace and conflict prevention slash resolution. It's actually switched. So now we call it peace building and conflict prevention. And there's two reasons for that. Peace building is the ongoing act of creating peace at the local level. So it's not something that you know, starts and stops. It has this process of engaging and continuing to engage over the longer term. And what we had seen from, from the history, the five-year history, which is a short history of peace building within Rotary, 
is that Rotarians are really best positioned to work on the larger scale, the broad-based prevention activities. So how do we actually prevent a conflict from happening as opposed to mediating or stopping a conflict once it's already broken out? And again, if you have questions as we go through, please put them in the chat box and we will look at them um, once we are done with our formal presentation. So there are three main areas, and I also wanted to mention that I'm not really addressing scholarships in, in, in this session. So scholarships, briefly for those of you that are interested, are any scholarship outside of the Rotary Peace Fellowship program that happens that has master's level course, coursework directly related to peace building. So I'm happy to have a conversation offline, but this session is really focused on what are we trying to do in our own communities um, at the local level. So what we've seen through, um, through the history of what Rotary has, um, has been doing is really focused primarily still in this education space, right? So the peace education piece is very strong and that includes training, capacity building, and then general peace education. In addition to that, Rotarians, we've seen um, many projects that provide services that help, help integrate vulnerable populations in, into society. And I wanted to um, put a, a little ping in here because this is a, a more specific than just any type of project. This is looking at um, refugee support. This is looking at at-risk youth. These are populations that have somehow been affected by conflict or are marginalized communities which have the, the that might lead to some type of conflict or division within, within a community. And then the third one that we've seen are programs that improve dialogue and community relations. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the environment and how Rotary works within the environment. And so our current policy statements carve out specifically areas in which Rotarians can provide uh, platforms to have youth, to have community members talk about and facilitate dialogue around the use of natural resources. So these are a lot of words, but I'm going to try to dive down a little bit more into what actually pertains to, to eligibility. So, and then I'll talk also, give you some examples about, you know, what, what are some projects that have been eligible and that, that are strong, um, easy to, to get approved within the Rotary system. So when we talk about eligibility, and especially training programs. We're talking about specific workshops with trainers um, and other programs that have very clear linkages to peace education, to peace leadership, to positive peace is one of the other ones that I, that I, um, that I uh, delineated here. So we're talking about um, facilitated dialogue, nonviolent communication, but they have to have very specific topics that relate to peace building. We also approve school-based or community-based education projects for youth to work on constructive ways to prevent, manage, and transform conflict. We also approve training programs or campaigns. These can be advocacy communication campaigns that um, address uh, conflict or show ways to manage conflict related to uh, preventing human trafficking related to natural resources. And then also when I spoke about the vulnerable populations earlier, we also support programs that provide legal, psychological, social, and rehabilitative services that integrate these vulnerable populations into society. So let me just take a pause here and talk a couple about a couple different projects that um, that fall into these areas. So I don't have a slide for them, so I'm just gonna give you a, the, a verbal explanation. And it's gonna be brief, but this will just kind of spark your imagination into you know, what, what, what is eligible. So we had a program in Israel that, that um, brought together Israeli and Palestinian youth from different faith and cultural backgrounds. And we did a three-week training program that looked at peaceful and collaborative interactions, and we did it through a watershed management program. So 
They were bringing different people together to learn about how to manage a river, but they were also learning leadership skills, communication skills, and they were developing deep relationships that were able to then also have um, outcomes of, of peace building. We had at, in Chicago, we've had a number of different projects, but there's been um, a project in the Chicago schools that looks at art therapy for, for children that have experienced severe trauma within their neighborhoods due to violence. There's also in another Chicago school, an integrated curriculum that looks at tools and specific strategies to develop both calm inner peace and then also be able to learn how to bring that out and have better um, conflict management. So how can we manage a conflict that does not inc include a gun, but includes a conversation? We also had a human trafficking program in Sacramento, California that um, wrote, raised awareness about the prevalence and also the prevention of human trafficking there locally. So again, I'm going to be providing everyone with a number of different resources, but those are just some specific examples of what is eligible. And Simona is going to talk a lot more in summer as well about positive peace in our relationship with the Institute. But I also wanted to make a plug here that if you are interested in the broad based and systems approach to peace building, we have curriculum and outlines for any Rotary Club or district to take and either implement a local um, club or district based program or also engage in a global grant. So that is also available to you. And we highly encourage everyone to look at that. And I believe um, we'll be sharing some other IEP resources at the end. Okay, so I wanted to briefly touch on what does not work within global grants. So what is not eligible? Um, again, the, this is broad based. I wish I could, you know, give everyone a 20 point punch list of this is eligible, this is not. But really what we need to be doing is looking at our communities and seeing what is, um, what is the problem and what is the best solution. But we have laid out a number of different projects that are activities that are not eligible. So peace conferences um, in which Rotarians are the primary participants. Now, I want to point out here that this does not mean that Rotarians in some way cannot participate in the trainings that we're doing, in the activities that we're doing, but you cannot use a global grant, for example, to fund a district conference around peace. So that's one um, line that the trustees have laid out for us. If we're doing a school-based program, if we're doing a community-based community -based program for youth, there has to be a curriculum. There has to be activities related specifically to peace building. It cannot be just providing um, violins for music or um, a judo class or karate. Those can exist, but they have to exist in parallel with some type of peace building curriculum. And if you have questions about that, we can always show you examples of what has been done in the past. You cannot use global grants to enroll at Rotary Peace Centers. Um, it's also a very clear definition that um, our trustees have laid out. So uh, we, you cannot have a global grant scholar studying at a peace center. And then the last bullet point here is that projects that just don't have a program. So really what we're looking at is training, education, bringing people together. I always look at peace building as a human to human um, activity, right? So we're not buying, we're not only buying a bus. You can't only buy a bus or you can't only buy a computer system. Um, you can't plant just a peace pole. You can't fund research. These are individual things that you actually cannot do through global grants. You have to have a more integrated um, project and you really have to be thinking about the community the needs and the sustainability. So this is one of my last slides and then I'm gonna hand it over to my colleagues. But I did want to take a pause here on community assessment because I do think that before you look at the do's and don'ts of global grants, before you go down this path, I think that this step right here is the most important and sometimes the most confusing for everybody and myself included. So you look at a community and you think, okay, we have, we have issues. So where do I start, right? And I think the first one is intentionality. So you really look at, I always say pause, really look at your community, 
figure out who you know and start to have conversations and then start to really look at what are some of the communities that maybe I haven't talked to before? Who is working in those communities? Who, can, who has a good pulse on what's happening there, a good understanding of what's happening there? Um, for, for peace building and conflict prevention, we really encourage, if you're looking at a community-based program, to consult your local government to understand the dynamics, especially if you are working in a conflict area. If you are not understanding the dynamic with the local government, you are potentially setting yourself up for failure or having to close down your project. So you really have to think that through. Um, for because, especially in um, areas with active conflict, because this can be so sensitive, working with, with organizations that are already embedded and have trust in the community makes everything go a lot smoother. So we highly recommend that. And then the last, the last point for your community assessment, and this will probably happen towards the end, is what is your theory of change? This is a fancy word that essentially means what do you think will happen? What is going to be the result of your project? How do you think it's going to change the situation? So think about this and think about it hard because sometimes it's actually the answer is really not clear. Okay, and my very last slide, I started out, I ended, or started and ended with very bright orange slides with little words on them, but I feel like these are actually sometimes the most meaningful. So what I've been thinking a lot about, especially as it relates to peace building, is this idea of policy versus culture. So we can change a lot of policies, we can create a lot of policies, but if we do not change ourselves and our viewpoints and our understanding of others, and how we relate to others, then those policies are not gonna get very far. So I encourage everyone to think about programs that allow people to reflect, that allow people to get to know others in different ways. So these are not, um, sometimes these can, look, these can be seen as a little bit squishy um, or uh, not have you know, uh, concrete outcomes. But within Rotary, these are actually very eligible. And I can show you examples of how we do um, self-reflection exercises or how some, especially with youth, how we get some dialogue practices. So this idea of how we change ourselves and change the culture to be more open and understanding. Um, I'm in the US, but for right now, that seems like a very, very important um, topic for us to all, to all consider right now. So that should be the end of my slides. And of course, we're going to have um, time for conversation afterwards, but I'm going to stop my share and hand it over to Summer. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Let me open my PowerPoint. OK. Am I live? Yes. OK, great. It's very exciting. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing. And it's also great to see all of the different questions that are coming into the chat box. So Rebecca shared a little bit about working with community partners and why it's important in her presentation. And so I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into that in my presentation. And specifically, what I want to cover is a little bit of background on my experience working with community partners, as well as being a community partner on peace building global grants, who you can engage as a community partner, how you can engage with them, and some tools and resources for engaging. So a little bit about my experience and why I'm here sharing this with you. Uh, so I've been involved with Rotary in one way or another since 2004 and have been involved in grants from Rotary in one way or another since then. When I started out in 2004, I was the recipient of a volunteer service grant from Rotary to go to Guatemala for an international service project. And then in 2011, I became a Rotary Peace Fellow, which 
is a form <laughs> of a grant from Rotary. And following the Rotary Peace Fellowship, I went on to provide monitoring and evaluation services for two global grants in Mexico. So then converted into what we could consider a global grant implementer. And then at present, as Rebecca mentioned, I currently work as the coordinator of the Rotary IEP partnership. And in this work, um, in this work for Rotary, not, it's not necessarily something that's officially part of my job, but informally, I've helped develop, assess, and provide support for peace building global grants. So just to give you a little bit of background to understand why I'm here sharing more with you today. So I mentioned the global grants in Mexico and Colombia that I've worked on. So for Mexico, I've worked on two in 2017 and 2019 as a Rotary Peace Fellow. So in a way, I was a community partner working as a Rotary Peace Fellow to provide monitoring and evaluation, an essential component of any global grant. And then in 2019, I helped to support global grant, a global grant in Colombia for positive peace workshops. And this was more an advisory role within my position as the Rotary IEP Partnership Coordinator. But more specifically, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what that involved, it, it involves supporting Rotarians in designing the Peace Building Global Grant, connecting with international sponsors, liaising with the expert organization, Partners Global and Partners Columbia, that were brought on board to facilitate positive peace workshops. I also assisted with the community assessment process. And finally, I've stayed in touch with all of the different Rotarians and partners working on this as we've been discussing, discussing potential replication of that global grant. So to get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of working with community partners, there's a number of options of who you can engage with as a community partner. Now, just really quickly, for the sake of this presentation, I'm using the term community partner rather loosely. This can refer to an individual, it can refer to an organization, it can be uh, a network even. And this entity can be involved as a volunteer or as someone offering or an organization offering professional services that are remunerated. They can be local, national, or international, but what's common amongst all of these actors as I talk about community partners is that they support a community-based Rotary project and more specifically a Rotary Global Grant. So a very obvious go-to for who you can engage uh, as an expert are Rotary Peace Fellows. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program, I'd highly suggest you visit the rotary.org website and, and investigate more. This whole peace conference is being put on by the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association. Essentially, Rotary Peace Fellows, there's more than 1,300 of us in the world, individuals who have gone on to master's level and certificate program studies in peace and conflict resolution, experts in their field in peace building in a very broad sense. Uh, so these are individuals who are great to engage for a peace building global grant, depending on the theme and or geographic area that you're looking at. Just to quickly note, for example, the Mexico and Colombia positive peace workshop global grants that I mentioned, those involved Rotary Peace Fellows heavily. In Mexico in 2017 and 2019, four of us were involved, myself, Jorge Maruvia, Wendy Colson, as well as Carlos Juarez, who now works for the Institute for Economics and Peace. In Colombia in 2019, Rosalvina Otalora uh, helped to assist with that particular global grant. And from what I know from the Mexico and Colombia global grants, at least six Rotary Peace Fellow applicants came out of workshop participants. And out of those, at least two have gone on to become Rotary Peace Fellows. So engaging Rotary Peace Fellows as community partners harvests their knowledge and experiences as well as cultivates future fellows. So another resource for you uh, for community partners are the Rotary Positive Peace Activators. And so this is a brand new program that's been created by the Rotary IP Partnership. 
and it includes Rotarians, Rotary Peace Fellows, Rotary Actors, and other Rotary stakeholders <clears throat> that have been selected, attended a 20-hour intensive training on the Positive Peace Framework, which we've been mentioning a lot, uh, the framework that the Institute for Economics and Peace works with, and that Rotary that connects to the Rotary areas of focus. And these activators make a two-year commitment to provide educational training and project support to Rotarians. So I know we have a number of activators here today. Uh, I saw Chris Offer, Jim Halderman on our, in, our, in our presentation. And additionally, Simona Pinton, who will be presenting after me as an activator. So these are wonderful resources uh, for supporting peace building global grants. And then moving on to organizations. Uh, so if you want to engage an organization as a community partner, Rotary has official partnerships or service partnerships with a number of organizations such as Mediators, Beyond Borders International, Outward Bound Peacebuilding, and New Gen Peacebuilders. Additionally, we've worked with an organization called Partners Global on positive peace workshops. So these are organizations that have worked with Rotary for a long time. They understand Rotary and Rotarians and have established relationships with them. In terms of other uh, community partners, local nonprofits and community organizations seem pretty obvious. Um, but I sometimes find that Rotarians maybe don't always know about them or it's not always a, an immediate thought to ally with and work with organizations that already exist in the, in the community. So this is something that at least I really encourage people to consider as they're thinking about doing a project or a global grant. What local nonprofits that have a lay of the land, they understand what's going on, and they may be working in a project area or theme that you as a Rotarian want to engage. So really think about looking locally and potentially combining forces. And then moving more internationally, there's a number of peace building networks that you can potentially engage, engage experts in their field. These include the Alliance for Peace Building, peace building. and then geographically, there's a number of different organizations in Europe, Africa, et cetera. I'll be providing a list of all of these resources. Well, I believe Kathy's going to put them into the chat box. So all of this information will be more detailed in the tools and resources uh, document that will be shared. All right, so getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty here. How do you engage community partners? You figured out who you wanna work with, but how do you do it? Um, there's no definitive guide for engaging partners, as a lot can vary on the way that the expert or the expert organization works, as well as the way that Rotarians work. But what I've done here is to create a bit of a very basic recipe, if you will, based on my work with global grants and community partners. So some tips and ideas for how to work together. So first off, it's really important that you ensure alignment between entities. This may seem really obvious, um, but it's just really important to ensure that if you're a Rotary Club or district working with a community partner, that you're aligned in terms of values and ways of working. Next, it's key to establish a mutual understanding of the terms of engagement from the get-go. So this is an important conversation to have, even if you're just starting discussions about a potential collaboration. Is a community partner expected to be a volunteer or provide volunteer services, or will they be engaged as a professional offering paid services? And if so, will this be written into the global grant budget? So I wanna be Frank here, this can be a really sensitive conversation based on the diversity of how Rotarians and expert organizations work, but it's a key conversation to have early on. You should also discuss openly time availability. We all know that there's a myriad of different types of Rotarians, those who work full-time or work multiple full-time jobs to those who are retired. Community partners are also similar. They may be full-time working professionals. They may be retired. It depends. So it's important to really have this conversation to establish expectations of time availability. It's also important to establish a clear expectation of deliverables. And in the consulting world, this is just a basically a fancy way of saying the products or what's gonna be done in a project. 
You also want to talk about levels of engagement or levels of effort. So again, throwing in some consulting terms here, I've been a consultant in the past, LOE, level of effort, this just refers to how much time will go into deliverables for a project. It's just talking about expectations. And then moving a little bit beyond that, you need to define community partner involvement in any pre-grant approval processes. So this includes community assessment and grant planning. So for those of you who've worked on a global grant, you know that the Rotary Foundation now requires a community assessment. And Rebecca talked about the importance of this, and I couldn't agree more. I'm so, I've worked in international development for 15 plus years, and community assessment is an absolute necessary best practice. But what you want to discuss with your community partner is if they'll be assisting with the community assessment. Many have the skills to do so, but funding for this component, at least from my understanding, can't be included in the global grant budget. So this is something you need to establish. Is it remunerated as part of the services someone might provide, or is the expert or organization willing to volunteer for this? And then in terms of grant planning, it's really important to think about how involved a community partner might be in planning and writing the grant, as well as any sort of pre-approval meetings. So a lot of time can pass between initial discussions about a global grant to the actual application process, to submission to the Rotary Foundation, and then waiting for grant approval. At least in my experience, this can sometimes take up to a year. So it's important that Rotarians consider what this timing might mean for a community partner and vice versa. Uh, so to, to think about, is that community partner being engaged as a volunteer or in a remunerated capacity? And what does that mean in terms of this kind of waiting space? So in the consulting world, when, when I worked as a consultant, it's not really common to start working on a project without a contract or without an initial payment. But this can be normal in the global grant world. We're talking about a potential year time lapse before a global grant is approved. So it's just important to be conscious of this and to really think about and openly discuss this with a community partner. And finally, it's important to make clear that there's no guarantee that a grant will be approved. So if you're engaging with a community partner, again, it's important to be upfront and open about this so that there's no um, misalignment in terms of expectations. Now, once a mutual agreement of understanding has been reached, you need to get this on paper. It's important to have an MOU or a memorandum of understanding. This list roles, responsibilities, deliverables, and outlines all expectations of all parties involved. It helps to create clarity and avoid problems in the future. There are a number of MOU templates available online. Um, so I would highly encourage you to consider using that as you're working with a community partner. And just to wrap up this part, it's always recommended that as you're working on your global grant budget that you build in a cushion of funding. So this can be to adjust for currency fluctuations if you're working internationally, as well as unexpected changes in costs or fees. Also keep in mind as you're working with a community partner, if that community partner is volunteering, there may still be costs involved for them. And will those be covered by the grant? So travel, food, et cetera. Now, if you're working with a community partner that will be remunerated, this is still also something to consider. And those costs should be clearly outlined in the MOU. For example, does the expert have to cover their own travel, food, or expenses? Or are those built into their project support services fee? Or are those covered by the grant? So these are just a few, but by no means exhaustive suggestions for working with community partners on global grants. So if I could sum them up, I would channel my idol, Esther Perel, a relationship guru. Everything today in relationships is a negotiation. So above all, if you work with a community partner on a global grant, or if you're a community partner working with Rotarians, consider that you're in a relationship and open communication is essential. 
So speaking about relationships and negotiation, there's one more thing that I'd like to touch on in my presentation. And Rebecca brought this up in her presentation uh, as well. Do no harm and conflict sensitivity. So this is a key component of any project and especially of a global grant in the peace building area of focus. So in developing a project, global grant implementers and community partners should seriously consider how their interventions and actions may have unintended consequences. And we wanna to seek to avoid those. We wanna to seek to do no harm. So one of the reasons behind encouraging Rotarians to work with experts and expert organizations is to implicitly get a more nuanced, local and community-based perspective. More explicitly, it's important to carry out an actual conflict sensitivity analysis for your project. This may also be something that a community partner has expertise in and can assist with. So for resources, CDA Collaborative Learning is an organization and leader in peace building. And they're considered the founder of Do No Harm. They have a wealth of information and resources available on their website, which will be linked into the document that I'll share. And this can provide you uh, a guided process for how to do a conflict sensitivity analysis for a current project or a potential project. So just to wrap up here, again, all of this will be documented in, uh, in the Google, Google Doc that uh, Kathy's sharing in the chat box. But if you're interested in engaging with community partners and you want to look for a Rotary Peace Fellow, for example, there's the Rotary Rotarian Action Group for Peace has a peace map, which is one way to look for Rotary Peace Fellows that might be in your area. You can also contact Bill Rance, who's the alumni coordinator for the Rotary Peace Fellows. And you can contact him and indicate where you're looking for a Peace Fellow, what theme or what area, uh, what type of project. Now, in terms of connecting with the Rotary Positive Peace Activators, as I've mentioned, that's through me. So I've left my email here and please feel free to contact me. Uh, at the moment, we have a group of activators, 26 in the US and Canada, and we're also in the process of training 30 in Latin America. But between now and 2022, we're gonna be training in four more regions. So there will be a global presence of activators. And then finally, the partner organizations and resources list is being shared in the document. I know that someone had a question if these materials will be shared or the PowerPoints. We will do that after, after this session. So just quickly to conclude, Rebecca talked about why it's important to engage community partners in a peace building global grant. And I'd like to add one more thing to, to, to everything that she said and everything she said is spot on. But I'd like to, to add that engaging community partners who are experts in their field, who have cultivated knowledge, skills, and experiences that can be applied to a project, they can only enrich your initiative. So consider, if you will, working with community partners as an investment in the quality and ultimately the impact of your peace building project. And with Great. that, I'll turn it over to Simona. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, this is Rebecca, I just wanted to thank you so much, Summer. And I just, I'm seeing so many wonderful questions here in the chat box. So please keep them coming. Simona is going to be doing another piece of the presentation for about another 15 minutes. And then we're going to have a discussion on these questions, which are just wonderful. So thank you so much for sharing and keep them coming. Rebecca, do we want to do just a quick 10 second stand up and stretch? Sure. Before Simona. <laughs> if people want to do a 30 second stand up and stretch, they can do that and then we'll get going. But okay, thanks. Yeah. Can't be. <laughs> All right, people like the stretch option. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Do you see the video, Rebecca? I, I do not see the video. I see a, a PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, do you see it? Okay. Yes, yep, you're good. good. I have it in the full screen, so if you can tell me when uh, 
because I cannot see the participant. Mm, okay. Um, so. Yeah, we'll just give it like another 10 seconds and okay. if people are still stretching, that's totally fine. Okay, all right, um, we're gonna get started. Sorry, that was like probably the shortest stretch break ever, but um, uh, we're gonna get going. I do want, this is, this is really interesting information I think will be um, helpful to people, but I really do wanna make sure we have time for some of these questions. Um, okay, so thanks everyone. And Simona, over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. So, Hi everyone, my name is Simona, Simona Pinton, I'm Italian and uh, I'm a Peace Fellow dating back to uh, 2004 actually when uh, there was still a, peace and, uh, a Rotary Peace Center in Berkeley at University in California and I joined Rotary in 2010 and uh, I also have the privilege to serve as a, a technical coordinator of the, the peace building and conflict prevention cadre of technical advisors of the of the Rotary Foundation. Uh, for those who do not know what the cadre is, the cadre is a, a group of volunteer Rotarians who provide technical expertise and advice to Rotarian planning and carry out Rotary grant projects around the world. And uh, this is a very open body. So if you wanted to join it and uh, to put your expertise at disposal of uh, clubs and uh, district, please visit the Rotary page on cadre technical advisors. So uh, what I would like to do today with you is just to offer a little um, a brief uh, theoretical journey um, on the idea of peace and uh, uh, providing two conceptual tools uh, according to which uh, uh, our work as Rotarians could be um, even more effective and uh, comprehensive on, uh, on the field. And uh, I will do that uh, um, starting from the overall mission and vision of Rotary touching a little bit on the impact on grants uh, and uh, uh, sharing the idea of peace uh, as uh, a cross-cutting and a transversal area of focus. Uh, and then moving specifically on these two theoretical tools, one is positive peace and system thinking that are strictly related. And then a, sh a little reference to how these two tools uh, apply to all the Rotary work. So let's start with the uh, mission and vision. Um, generally speaking, any one of us uh, know that uh, we want to do good in the world, but which good and how? The mission and the vision provide us with uh, the um, quote-unquote instruction uh, because the mission is, uh, is uh, asking us to provide service to others, promote integrity and advance world understanding, goodwill and peace through our fellowship of business, professional and community leaders. And the vision is uh, to build a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe, in our communities and in ourselves. The work together is very crucial. And together means not just among us, but it means uh, with other partners. So partnership is indeed uh, crucial for the successful of, of the project, but it means also uh, to create this lasting change, uh, starting with welcoming talents and ideas of others. So it's going beyond uh, the traditional partnership uh, for valuing diversity and uh, differences. And so summarizing is to create positive peace. Before um, focusing on one uh, on, on these, these thoughts of uh, peace as a, a transversal area, I would like to uh, make reference to two uh, recent developments. I think somebody of you already mentioned in the chat that uh, recently the Rotary Foundation trustees and the Rotary International Board of Directors have added a new area of focus that is supporting the environment and creating a distinct area of focus to support the environment will give us Rotarians even more ways to bring about positive change 
in the world and increase our impact. And the grants application for this specific type of project will be accepted beginning on 1st July 2021. The second reference is uh, to the action plan. And uh, you know well that fulfilling a vision requires a plan. And there are four strategic priorities that uh, uh, define these, uh, these plans. Increase our impact, expand our reach, enhance participant engagement, and increase our ability to adapt. What it means? It means that people, as people of action, we want to be and we have to be effective problem solvers. We need to activate and inspire one another. We need to strive to understand the needs of others and to be inventive, entrepreneurial, and resilient. So, um, in relation to this thought that uh, um, peace, uh, peace is uh, a cross-cutting area. Um, the idea is uh, very much um, explained and uh, by this statement of the General, General Secretary of Rotary International, in which uh, he um, is saying clearly that uh, any Rotarians uh, creating and just uh, designing and implementing a grant uh, and the project through a global grant or another type of grant in each of our focus is a peace builder. And uh, of course, there is a specific area of focus that is the one uh, we start from, that is peace building and conflict prevention. But uh, it's clear to anyone that uh, there is always a component on peace that is uh, um, included and should be preserved and promoted in, uh, uh, through the, the global grants and through the other rotary programs. Um, if we are going to see the policy statement for each area of focus, we clearly see that uh, um, they are all directing to the same uh, um, condition, but also objective. That means to create a, a, a condition of, that is sustainable, uh, situation that are measurable, and uh, of course, the project should be community driven and uh, um, Summer and Rebecca already uh, very much explain about the relevance of a community focus. Um, so peace uh, is, uh, um, is come and going, is just really transversal to all the area of focus. And in one sense, uh, but this is very my interpretation, I see also environment as a, uh, an area of focus that should be in one way or the other be a component in, the, in, each, of, uh, uh, in each project that uh, Rotarians could, uh, could design and implement. Uh, moving now to the conceptual tools uh, I mentioned before, these two um, tools, uh, um, according to my um, research and according to my thinking, are um, it could help to create positive change. Uh, one is positive peace, as it has already been mentioned several times uh, during this presentation, and the other is system thinking. Positive peace is a framework, is a process for social positive change. Uh, system thinking is more a theory that is supporting the, uh, the positive peace. Positive peace is uh, indeed one of the main areas of research and focus of uh, the Institute of Economic and Peace. The Institute of Economic and Peace and Rotary uh, International and the Rotary Foundation started this partnership in 2017. And uh, IEP, the Institute of Economic and Peace, is an independent nonprofit think tank dedicated to shifting the world focus to peace as a positive, achievable, and tangible measure of human well being and progress. It does this by developing global and national indices, calculating the economic cost of violence, analyzing country level risk, and understanding positive peace. And the research is very much used by uh, governmental and non-governmental actors. Uh, the partnership between IP and Rotary uh, very much capitalizes on uh, IP research on the attitudes, institutions, and structures of more peaceful society, 
and on Rotary grassroots experience in communities around the globe. Um, so positive peace is defined exactly as the attitudes, institution and structure that create and sustain peaceful society. Negative peace is the absence of violence or fear of violence. But what is important to underline is that the two, uh, the two concepts are strictly interconnected. Um, and uh, this is a relationship that is not deterministic, but is rather systemic. But uh, of course, the focus is uh, on uh, uh, which kind of condition or uh, which kind of uh, um, situation can promote more peaceful societies. And uh, uh, this scheme is well represented by the existence of eight pillars. The eight pillars you see in the picture on, uh, on the, in, in the image on, uh, on, on the left and are mainly eight. And they refer to the low levels of corruption, the acceptance of the rights of others, free flow of information, sound business environment, high levels of human capital, equitable distribution of resources, good relation with neighbors, and well-functioning government. Um, it could be interesting to go through uh, each of these pillars, but uh, of course there is no time. But I know that uh, perhaps a, a specific session uh, has been devoted in this conference to uh, positive peace, or will be. I'm uh, I'm a bit a little bit lost with <laughs> with the different uh, uh, time frame, but uh, there will be a session specifically devoted to go more into detail of this uh, concept of positive peace. Uh, what I would like to share with you is uh, um, the knowledge that these. Uh, uh, eight pillars not only sustain peace, but also support an environment where human potential could, uh, could flourish. They interact in a complex way and are multidimensional and are generally slow moving. They, uh, moreover, they can act at uh, uh, macro and also macro level. So this is a sort of uh, uh, concept that uh, uh, finds its uh, way and find its uh, life in, uh, uh, in at both level, in the both dimension. But also what is interesting is that uh, these pillars may be used to analyze ways communities can develop in order to sustain peace or to recover from conflict. And is also a tool that helps communities become more resilient and recovers from shocks that were not predicted or expected, exactly like the novel coronavirus outbreak. And there is a very interesting uh, study that has been released uh, almost one month ago that is dealing specifically with the positive peace and uh, the uh, current pandemic. Um, what is interesting for me to share with you, just because I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, conducting you in this theoretical journey, is to underline the transformational nature of positive peace. Uh, why positive peace is transformational? Um, positive peace is defined in this base on empirical research, and through this empirical research, uh, positive peace uh, help to uh, create shift uh, from uh, uh, sorry shift the focus away from the negative to the positive aspect that create the condition for a society to flourish. It this. Uh, um, notion and uh, uh, the, uh, the conceptual uh, pillars on which it is built outlines the factors that more favorably create an environment that leads to other positive outcomes. So is a reframe the study of peace towards what works. 
And uh, it's a cross-cutting facilitator of progress, uh, making it easier for business to sell, entrepreneurs and scientists to innovate, individuals to produce, and governments to effectively regulate. And of course, it is a measure of uh, social resilience. So uh, through this capacity, transformational capacity, positive peace uh, create and uh, may create a process of so for social change. Indeed, without an understanding of the factors that create and sustain peaceful society, it will not be possible to develop to the programs, create the policy or understand the resources that are required to build peaceful and resilient society. So this is just a template and you will go through when you will receive the PowerPoint presentation that better explain uh, this idea of positive peace as a process of change through and uh, define outcomes on in the short, medium and, uh, and long term. And align what is uh, the, the, the nature and the function of positive peace with uh, uh, the mission at the end of Rotary that is really to create a world that is more peaceful and fulfilling for the majority of the people of the planet. Uh, another interesting document uh, that is produced by the Institute for Economics at Peace is the Global Peace Index uh, and is provide you with the, um, the data and the methodology on how to measure peace and peaceful in a complex world. Um, last week, uh, the Global Peace Index 2020 has been released. You can find it uh, at the link uh, um, uh, that is written on the slide. And uh, this is the 14th uh, Global Peace Index. Uh, um, it's a very interesting document. And of course, it's uh, uh, very much stimulating and fascinating because uh, it uh, brings us into, uh, into the methodology, into the data, and into the scientific approach on how to measure, to measure peace. Um, as mentioned by the, um, Rebecca and, uh, and Summer, a new program uh, is the, the Peace Activator. I joined the program in January. I've been fortunate to join the program. And uh, this is a, a program that uh, is, um, has been added actually to activities that uh, Rotary and the Institute already already uh, promoted and offered to Rotarians, but to the entire uh, world community in the past, like the Peace Academy. But of course, uh, positive peace activators uh, that are both Rotarians and non-Rotarians, uh, we have the clear commitment on trying to uh, engage as much, uh, uh, as many Rotarians as possible in this thinking, in this uh, idea of how to uh, positive peace uh, can inform and inspire our work. Uh, system thinking, uh, quite uh, um, briefly, think thinking is, is a theory and uh, is a, um, it, it has its origin in, uh, um, in the thinking connecting to uh, nature and to the study of, uh, um, of the, um, the biological system and the organism, such as the cell and the human body, why it could be uh, important. And systems thinking is important because uh, it's providing us a, a mindset to see problems as, uh, uh, to see the, uh, the problems not as uh, intractable challenges, but as uh, uh, challenges that can be addressed. And this proposing uh, four key mindsets shift because it is uh, suggesting us uh, to uh, seek health and on mission accomplished in each situation. So to focus on the health of the system, to see patterns and not just problems. And so the patterns behind the problem, to unlock the change and don't impose the change, and also to plan to adapt and not to stay, uh, to stay the course. There is a very interesting short video that is explaining better than me this thing. But what is, why is, is relevant? Because it's uh, showing that there is a, a bigger picture. There, is a, uh, there are system and subsystem that uh, exist, interact, and uh, there are interdependence between, uh, between them. And so when we approach uh, um, a situation and when we see some 
needs in a community and we want to develop uh, um, global grants, I think this approach could be helpful. And this not just because uh, it's uh, bringing us beyond the specific situation we, and need we want to address, the specific area of focus we want to work on, but is also helping us uh, to um, to provide a framework with some outcomes that are going beyond the specific uh, addressing and satisfaction of the needs. And uh, system thinking so could be a lens for project concept, design, funding, delivery and evaluation. And positive peace framework provides a way to structure this thinking. And uh, global grants, but all the Rotary programs so inspired may convey a strong message about the importance of positive peace more broadly to decision and policy maker, media and the public at large. So I will end here because I don't want to take uh, uh, more, uh, more time to uh, a debate or a dialogue and the questions, but if you wanted to have our uh, contact detail, this is, uh, the, um, this is the slide provided them. And of course, I uh, give back the floor to Rebecca and to Summer and uh, especially to you for the question. And thank you very much for, for listening. Simona, thank you so much. That was, um, that was wonderful. And I think that everyone can probably see how much, um, while there's so many ways to enter the peace building space within Rotary, positive peace is certainly a theme. And I think that the reason for that is because of the systems approach. Simona touched on that, but everything in peace building, you have to look at all of the different components that make the system. So we'll be sharing those resources. There's videos. There's just so, there's so many rich resources that we can um, provide for you to, to uh, for you to start your own learning around those things. Okay. But for now, I want to get to your questions. So I'm going to hand it over to Kathy and she's been monitoring. I've been looking at them as well. So she's going to help us facilitate some of these um, important questions that you all had. So Rebecca, there are um, a lot of questions just about what is funded. So the global grant process and what kinds of things can actually be funded. So um, one of those questions relates to the peace incubators and those programs and are those funded through global grants or are there other road resources for funding for those? When you say peace incubator, are you talking about the activator program? Well, that's a good question because I, like Walter, I think in Europe, were they, weren't they doing some um, incubator programming around peace? I have no idea how that's being funded. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to take that. And I know there was another question about an international lecturer, which I think is, is an interesting example. So I think the best way to think about this, and when I started out the conversation, I said, you know, Rotary, there's this big umbrella of peace in Rotary. And there's all these different ways to fund your programs, right? It could be a local club. It could be a district grant. Global Grants has very specific funding parameters. And I will send you the actual documents that kind of lay that out. But sometimes the documents um, don't answer specific questions. So let me take the incubator, the activator program, and the lecturer example and talk specifically about those. So if you're a district and you want to get a group of people together and you want to bring a famous speaker on peace building to come and give a one-time talk, to a group of people. That is not eligible as a global grant. And let me tell you why, okay? Um, because you have not necessarily looked at your community. You might have brought together a group of people, but you have not identified the problem and said that, okay, this is the, the work that I want to do, and this is going to be my program, and this is going to be the intervention or the, the, the solution, part of that intervention has to have a sustainability component. So bringing one person in to give a one-time talk, in my mind, is not going to have a long-term impact on your community. The way that you would revamp that or um, adjust that to a global grant-eligible pro project would be talk to your community, decide what types of people 
are in your community and you need to talk to. If you wanted to say, okay, we understand that there is a need even for an understanding of what um, an alternative way to develop, uh, or alternative way to deal with conflict, then maybe that international lecturer is the right person to come in but it's part of a broader training program that develops capacity that will last in the community after that lecturer goes home. So there's a lot of the sustainability component that we need to think about. What is going to create that lasting change? And that's typically a one-time talk, a one-time conference. Um, it has to have some type of lasting change in the community. Um, the incubator program Walter, I know he is putting that on as well. Um, I, I am not quite as familiar with the uh, details, but again, you want to look at what is the ultimate benefit to your community. So as far as I know, the Rotary Foundation is not funding, I think the incubator program is bringing people together, bringing Rotary Peace Fellows and international organizations together in Geneva. Rotary International is not funding that piece what they would fund would be any projects that come out of the, those people talking and deciding what is good for their communities. So that is something that is, um, and forgive me, I don't know all the details, but that is something that is, is funded by Rotarians locally, but the projects that are coming out of it could potentially be eligible for, for global grant funding. Positive peace activators are even different they are part of a strategic partnership funded by Rotary International. So that is completely separate, and those are very far and few between, to be honest. The, the programs that the Rotary Foundation funds directly, so we have two. We have um, the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program, and we have our strategic partnership with the Institute for Economics and Peace. Okay, so we have, um, we have a number of questions about, so who can apply for global grants? Is it only Rotary Clubs and Districts? It, are, um, are Latin countries like Venezuela available to do that? And then even more specifically, like if you're a Rotary Peace Fellow and a Rotarian and working at an NGO, are you able to then, is your NGO, are you able to then, you know, apply for a global grant? Okay, so those are all really, really good questions. So I'm going to take the Venezuela part of that first. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I can't question, like, exclamation point that enough. So all countries everywhere, um, as long as they have a Rotary Club and a district in it, and in some cases, even if they don't, <laughs> are eligible to benefit from a global grant. Now, we'll be sharing the Global Grant Guide and definitely check out this next session, right? That's going to walk you through like the nuts and bolts of putting together a global grant. But we have, through the positive peace work, we have actually up until now focused on um, Latin America, not specifically in Venezuela, but next door in Colombia. And we hope to expand our work. So Latin America, absolutely. Um, who can apply for a global grant? Global grants are, um, we are a closed foundation. So the Rotary Foundation is in a sense a closed foundation. So we grant money only to Rotary clubs and districts. Rotary clubs and districts are the ones that have to apply for the grants and receive and manage the funds. However, we encourage, we just basically did a whole presentation, right, on the importance of partnering with community, with community organizations. So the projects should be um, implemented in conjunction with community organizations. Now they, and they can receive the funds for that implementation. So like a budget line item would be tr designing a curriculum, um, you know, facilitating uh, workshops. There can be 10% uh, line items for coordination. There can be pro project management expenses. So all of those different um, expenses that the, the community organization would be in charge of are absolutely eligible for global grant funding. But the Rotary Club and District have to receive and manage the funds. That's an important point. Now, not all of you might know this. Global grants also require a host and an international club or district. So there's a partnership piece within this. 
Um, I don't want to spend so much time on it because it's in the documents, but if I'm in Chicago and I want to implement something on the south side of Chicago, I would need my host club in Chicago. I would also need another club. It could be Canada, it could be Brazil, it could be France, but they need to partner with me on the, the project. They don't necessarily need to put any significant amount of funding, but I do need a partner. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. So the last piece of that was, um, if I'm a Rotarian, a Peace Fellow, and I have an organization, can I receive the funding? The, sh the answer is yes, but I also want you to be aware that there is a conflict of interest clause within Rotary that you just have to structure it, the w structure it in a way that um, you are not legally benefiting yourself through the foundation as a Rotarian. And again, I'll leave it at that. Um, we can also always go into more detail if you, if you need to. So there were a couple of questions around um, positive peace. So one was, um, do you have to use, you know, the, the, the theory, right, and the practice of looking at the eight pillars of positive peace and systems thinking, does that need to be something that gets incorporated into a global grant in order it, for it to be approved? And then another question was sort of how do we use um, you know, that in terms of, of in, in our global grants for peace and conflict prevention. Okay, I'm gonna let Simona address that uh, part, partially, but I just wanted to be very, very clear that there was obviously a focus on positive peace because we find it to be a very useful tool for analyzing projects. There are also resources that Rotarians can use to develop a global grant workshop and training through positive peace. So that's like its own project that you can that you can implement. Um, it is absolutely not required for you to use the positive peace framework for your peace project. It is not a requirement. It is just something that we like to offer people to help them understand peace building and peace in this more holistic way. So just to recap, there is a standalone global grant workshop that you can access and implement. You can use it to understand your projects better. It is not required. Simona, do you have anything to add? No, it's uh, perhaps I'm, I apologize. I'm not being very clear, but I was rushing. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, I mean, a lens, it's, a, it's an horizon we want to offer you and to offer you some uh, knowledge about positive peace for thinking our yeah. project and to have a, a framework of knowledge, perhaps many of you already are familiar with, but we think it's, uh, this positive peace is extremely relevant for helping us to approach uh, through a system thinking um, way our projects uh, and to, tr to try to also to make a sort of uh, interesting exercise whether the project could address the eight pillars and so have uh, positive outcomes that are going beyond. And this is, uh, but of course, is not a requirement, is not compulsory. Uh, this stage uh, is just uh, offering you an horizon of uh, based on this on this concept. Uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. interesting and helpful. Can I add something very quickly to that? <laughs> And it's just based on the Mexico and Colombia Positive Peace Workshop Global Grants. So we worked with the Positive Peace Framework and where it was really, really helpful was in doing the community assessment, in selecting participants who are working in the different pillars of positive peace, in arranging and organizing the content for the actual workshops, and then also in terms of following up with participants based on their projects after the event. So again, just reiterating what Rebecca and Simona are saying about it, the Positive Peace Framework providing a lens through which to see and organize a project. So we also had a couple questions um, more specifically around one, uh, would cultural education programming, for example, in the schools in the UK, would there be potential funding and international partners um, you know, to deliver the program and the targeted community? And then somebody had a question about um, engaging, have there been peace, um, grants that have engaged um, police or security mm. actors and 
you know, either as program participants or partners and what those outcomes, you know, might have been? Great questions. Um, so for the first one, I mean, cultural programming can be uh, general. So I'd want to actually like see what the program is, but any program that brings together people of different cultures, especially people of different cultures that have had historical conflict is absolutely appropriate and acceptable. Um, I think here, this is the challenge of peace building, right? For um, a well project, you like have an environment and you have probably four or five options of like what type of well or water management system is gonna work best. <laughs> For peace building, um, we don't say this is the right program to use, right? Like this is the way you do it. So it does take um, more thinking, more listening, more involvement of the actors to understand the context of the program. But I really, and more so now than ever, encourage people. I know that Dennis Wong, who's on, on this call, had talked about, oh, can we now work in policy or can we influence policy? Rotary is non-political. So I don't, I, we're, we cannot, um, we, we're just not able to fund grants that deal directly with like political uh, viewpoints. However, I encourage you to look at the cultural characteristics of conflict and how we can change those dynamics because ultimately that's what changes policy. <laughs> so that, that is my suggestion on that. Um, I'm sorry, Kathy, I got off on that. What was the other mm -hmm. part of that? Um, it was around oh, the policing. Was, yeah. was a good question. And then the other one was around um, police or security personnel yes. being involved or partners in projects. So we've obviously been getting a lot of questions about this, especially with the situation in the United States, but applicable globally. Um, we have not had numerous projects where we bring together police and community members, but if, if anyone is well positioned to do that type of thing, it is Rotary. So I would encourage you, even if it's not a global grant, you know, like global grants seem great, right? Because they give you this, this match of money, but sometimes these things don't cost money. You know, what about a community round table where you bring some chief of police, some community activists together and just have a simple conversation, right? You might want to find a mediator or people that can, you know, really hold that space, but we don't always have to have, you know, a big formal program to start having these conversations. Um, to my, not having my database in front of me, I do actually remember in India, there was, some, there was a project around um, nonviolent policing. And we have a number of Rotary Peace Fellows that have engaged in that work. Mm -hmm. So how to, um, I know that we've had some citizen, you know, citizen, um, uh, you know, policing also like some projects like that. So we've had some, but not necessarily in the context of, the, of, the, of what we're seeing now in the United States but I encourage all of you to start having conversations locally to see what's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as Rebecca said, there've been a number of uh, folks who have been peace fellows, who've been police officers, who have been um, in the um, armed forces in their countries who have come um, and benefited from the certificate program or the master's degree program, and then go on you know, to make changes um, in their community, but also partner with other Rotarians around projects. So. Um, so anything is possible. If you have an idea, please, you know, bring that, bring that to the fore. I see we have about two minutes left here. Um, somebody had asked about what the impact would be, because now there's a new um, focus, right? There's, um, or an additional, a seventh focus. Um, is that, how will that impact global grants? Um, and what, uh in terms of like the funding available or I don't know if I can see the, um, well, yeah. well yeah. 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 That was really kind of, um, the idea there. I don't know if there's going to be more funding now that there's another focus mm -hmm. or how does, or how does that, is there, I don't think that there's a priority on some of those things, but no, I yeah, there's no, that's a really good point. Yeah. There's no um, priority saying like this amount is reserved for disease prevention. This amount is reserved for education. It's really the, the grants that come in. Um, you know, I've always felt, you know, as the area focus manager for peace building, Oh, our global grants are small and this and that. Um, 
whereas I don't really feel badly about that anymore. Of course, everyone on this session, if, if we want to get, you know, get motivated and start putting in global grants, that's wonderful. I think that um, what we tend to show in those presentations are dollar amounts, right? So disease prevention makes a whole lot of sense that it's number one because it costs the most money. You're doing a lot of equipment, you're buying equipment, you're furnishing hospitals, you know, there's a lot of dollars, right? Peace is people. Peace is cheap. <laughs> That's what we always say, right? It doesn't actually cost a lot of money to bring people together. So I don't, I don't worry so much about the dollar amounts, but what I, and, and we are so, um, we're not just working for, through global grants, right? We have so many different programs that are happening in peace building. But in terms of the World Fund, um, I mean, there, it's a very dynamic global situation right now. We have a pandemic, we have, um, uh, we, we have this new area of focus. So we don't know how it's all going to shake out. I mean, we had a huge surge in mm -hmm. um, global grants related to COVID-19 over the last uh, four months. So we did have to stop uh, um, approving global grants um, ju in, on June 1, a month early. We're going to start again in July 1. So there, it, there are real pressures right now on the world front for a variety of reasons. But over the long term, I don't see any... Um, real problem with adding an area. I think that there's plenty of money. I just think it's, you know, um, the way that Rotarians want to want to develop and develop projects and spend it. So Rebecca, there is a question about how do folks access the Rotary Peace Curriculum, which I'm assuming would, might be the Institute of Economics and Peace, right? What? Peace. Okay, so I mean, I am going to out myself that our website is woefully out of date um, on uh, uh, rotary.org slash economics and peace. We can share that with you. So we have a club presentation and a district presentation for positive peace. Um, within the next month or so, we should be uploading a one day workshop that clubs and districts can use. And as Summer knows, because she's been working on it every day, we have a probably 200 page plus curriculum that walks districts and clubs through mapping a community, bringing people together, um, holding a one, two or three day workshop, doing monitoring and evaluation. So we have this massive curriculum that is coming out. It's just taken us a lot longer than we had hoped in terms of getting it ready to um, be available to all of you, but that is forthcoming. But in the meantime, we do have a number of curriculum that you can use. Um, even the one day workshop could be adapted using a community partner to a global grant as it is right now. So um, we will share with you the link and to the website. And I think you just need to keep looking at that for the updates over the next month or so. So I went ahead and put that link into the oh, great. chat box. And awesome. I, also, I also indicated, I know we're, we're out of time, but if people have very specific questions, I'm happy to field those questions. Send me an email. I, the email's in the document Simona shared, and I also put it in the chat box. And I'm happy to deal with that this coming week. Yes. Um, great. I can also add you to a list to receive an update when the curriculum comes out. So great. feel free to contact me. And I have not met Shah, but I heard his global grant workshops are um, pretty impressive. So again, if you want to get, you know, some of those details about like submitting a global grant, because it, it's a process, like it's, it's not, <laughs> it's not the easiest thing in the world. So I would highly encourage you to do that. Um, my guess is that moving forward, we're going to be having uh, more and more interactions like this around global grants. So we're also happy to field specific questions. So I guess we'll just say thank you to everyone for um, joining. It was good to see the familiar faces and some new faces, and I hope that uh, we continue to keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everyone. Have a thank good you. rest of your day. Stay well. Okay. Be safe.